will branch off into like UI, you know, or UX development um, until it happens. And you know, it's it's good to have that knowledge, but I mean, you come into a standpoint where with a lot of companies are looking for that true professional that's focused within a certain area. Um, you know, so for myself, if I see somebody that's kind of moved from this to that, you know, it makes me really question well, what is it that you're more comfortable in doing. I understand that some people want to branch out. Knowledge is power. Sometimes too much knowledge kind of gives a recruiter a thought process of saying, okay, well, he's got a lot of experience, but he's not mastering anything specific. Right. You know, so it, you know, how many people here have more than one resume? Okay, more than four resumes. Okay, good. You want to make sure you have a lot of different resumes to cater specifically to if you're applying for positions. Make sure that you have a resume that is focused specifically towards the position that you're targeting. And those positions are going to be different for every single company. Uh, like I said, the software stack is different. Take a look at the job description. Say, you know, if you have, like right now, gosh, this is the on my side. I'm looking for a senior back end developer, Java, that's got exposure to Linux. So, well, funny enough. Being pushed to be the technology state, those guys are hard to find. And if you do find them, they're at some major company like Amazon, and they're not willing to Amazon, Google, and they're not willing to do it. They won't be. Not even for me. Not even for what? Not even for me. No. Microsoft has a little baking card out in front of Right. No, no they, they, they don't. So it, it really makes the uh, search sometimes very difficult, you know, depending on technology. When do uh, like letters of reference uh, from you know employers or clients that you've worked with? When do those come into the process? Are those really late in the process or uh, generally right before an offer? Uh, is when most so after an interview. After the interview process, if, if you're selected, then at that time, recruiters should be asking you for your references. Uh, the other thing is too, uh, LinkedIn is a great place for that. Um, because then they can actually come in earlier oh, if they're yeah, funding. Like I said, a lot of recruiters are utilizing LinkedIn. You know, and, and once they're able to find you there, obviously there's a slot that says recommendations. I mean, get it from every person that you've reported to. Not a peer. Just people, managers that you've reported to. Because a lot of recruiters, before they'll even reach out to you, you take a look at those recommendations. They're saying, oh yeah, this person, you know, some people that have done recommendations for you. We're going to list out the specifics work with this person on this project, this is how they contributed, they did a phenomenal job, blah, 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 blah. <coughs> well, those things are really important because it gives a recruiter direct visibility as to, one, your work ethic, what you're capable of doing, um, even though maybe you may be lacking in a specific skill set, you know, and whatnot, so. Does that help? Question, you said not appear. What if you've worked for, like that, you've worked for a manager but a project manager uh, uh, recommendation from them. They're a colleague, but they're, they're not a direct report. Um, those are okay. The one thing that most recruiters are going to be a little leery of is that what was your, you know, was it a true working relationship or was it a level of friendship? Um, and so that's where recommendations can sometimes uh, be a little sticky. Uh, I prefer, in most companies, we'll prefer who you're reporting. That's what they're going to So if there's a clear working relationship with somebody and they state that in the recommendation, perhaps? Correct. And, correct. And it will. Right. Um, you know, as far as any type of recommendations, too, just keep in mind when they are calling like the previous company to find out, you know, uh, there's certain things out there that should not be asked. Um, however, people are always finding ways to work around it. You know, one of the key things is, okay, did this person work for you from this date to this date? And they're validating your work history. That's the first thing. Um, most people are not supposed to ask, is this person rehirable? That's a very catchy question. Uh, because they could technically answer it, and then, but they technically should not. Um, and the reason is, is because if I said, ah, no, he's not rehirable. Well, guess what? I just kind of almost prevented you from finding a job. Considered to be on a continuous uh, you know, standpoint of uh, consideration for both. Right? So, those are kind of things that you have. That's 
why I always ask for feedback. You know, somebody's going through that process and you're working with a good recruiter, they should be able to get feedback. I'll be the first to admit I can't provide feedback on 100%. I'll never say that I do, but I'm pretty doggone good. I'm 68, or sorry, 96 to 98%. Big key thing, thanks for bringing that up. What was the question? Portfolios. For web development, um, you know, if, if you're creative, if you do illustration or, or uh, website designs, here's one of the things I can tell you about NCSoft. Has anybody seen NCSoft's website? Yeah. It's a little crazy. Um, it needs some work. Uh, it does. <laughs> that's, why I'm, that's why I'm looking. So, um, that's right. <laughs> There's a Don't do of, that when you meet a client, though, okay? That's a bad thing. It's bad modeling. So portfolios are good. You know, there's there's a few websites that I go to, and you know, and, and these are websites that where I'm looking specifically for a portfolio, and this ultimately has to do with visual design on a website. We've got two positions for that role right now. The thing is, is that when people are making websites and they're trying to make it all pretty, what a lot of things is, is that if you're going to do a portfolio, do something kind of out of the box. Yeah. And the reason is, is because how many people go to a website and it's like, okay, there's the tabs all the way across the top, you know, this is, it's standard. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, like as an example, I'll use NCSoft. NCSoft not, doesn't think that way. They want you to come up with something creative, like circular icons. If you take a look at Carbine's website, you'll see planets. And as you scroll over those planets, those are your tabs to take you to wherever you need to go. Uh, I can't tell you how many people that have done website design, and it just all looks the same. Every single client that they may have, like freelance designers, they all look the same pattern. Mix it up. Be creative with it. Get out there and do something that's out of the ordinary. Come up with those ideas to do something with it. Because, you know, that's going to get you a lot more visibility. Um, I really enjoy that side, the, the, the creativity side, and being able to come up with something that was just nuts and just right. kind of leave it in. But I also enjoy the other side of that where we're actually putting in actually making the logic for that work. My concern is I don't want to get locked into one side where I'm just creating something and kicking it off to uh, somebody else to try to implement it. The creativity side would be for your portfolio for future right. things. And that's something that's going to be an ongoing basis. Um, I mean, as an example, when I work, work with the, the director of for these visual graphic designers, you know, for organization. The first thing that they told me was, we don't want anybody from my group. Not that there's not plenty of qualified individuals, and the reason is is because they're looking for somebody that's going to be more creative. Right. You know, that's that's just that specific part. I can't say that it's the same for everybody else. But just try to be a little bit unique and different, so you can get a lot more attention that way. Yes? Um, should you invest the time in, um, on the web developer portfolio, should you invest the time to put that up on a public server so your employers can look at it during the phone? Absolutely. I mean, I can't tell you how many times somebody will say, hey, I'm interested in this web developer role, and they'll shoot me the link to the portfolio, and that's the first thing I look at, you know. It's like, wow, okay, well, I see this, this person's done this. And then I may I mean, call them right on the, off the bat, because their contact information is on that portfolio. Call and say, hey, thanks for sending this over. You know, let me talk to you. How did you do this? Explain this to me. Um, from a recruitment standpoint, I'm always curious about stuff like that. You know, if I'm not learning from you, then I'm not going to be a good recruiter for you. you know? And uh, I mean, some of the stuff I've seen is really out of this world. You know, it's like you know, you're out there still. Um, and uh, you know, for from a recruitment standpoint, by forwarding a portfolio, saying Take a look at this guy. This is what they've done. Without even looking at the resume, that says a lot. That holds a lot of weight. I mean, at least 80, 90 percent in most cases. Because now they're not looking to see what's in black and white. They're looking at it and saying, "This is what this person's done. This is what they're capable of doing." And they're willing to move in that direction. So even if they didn't get paid to do those designs, they're just doing them to demonstrate what they can do. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Much and in some cases, by listing what you, you know, what you utilize to that specific site, which is also important too, because then a recruiter can kind of take a look at it, or even the manager and say, oh wow, they've got exposure to utilizing this, 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 this. So yeah. Like on my resume that I, I use for focusing on finding developer jobs, um, 
I've got the, that's the first thing after my name is my list of websites that I've done. Right. You know? And is it, do, you, do you recommend that I put that when I'm looking for that kind of job, put that as the primary call to action? Look at my web, look at my portfolio. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of times, you know, after your name, email address, and phone number, you know, and then it, it is, you know, some people actually put like their LinkedIn profile because LinkedIn. This is how good LinkedIn is. If you ever go to my LinkedIn profile, I have a I have a box. I have all the job descriptions in there. There's not very many recruiters out there that will that that do that. Um, the other thing is too, by sending somebody to your LinkedIn profile, you can also store all of your portfolio, web links, and everything else there too. I mean, it's it's a really dynamic uh, system to be part of right now. Uh, but you know, I mean, I do that a lot I mean, right now. I mean, most of my recruitment is not based as far as what's black and white. I'll put the resume. Like I said, I use LinkedIn. I get the resumes later after I see the just person has the offer. And then, then if you make it past the phone interview, uh, should you bring a printed flip book of your website? Uh, I would say keep it all on your computer. Bring your computer with you. They have a place where you can plug in and actually show them. Um, or just keep on a thumb drive or something. Exactly. That's, that's usually the best way. Especially sometimes, you know, I've, I've got interviews that get scheduled for five hours. You're there for five hours. Not only are you meeting with, the, the, you know, like 13 people, you know, then you've got a presentation time period, which is usually 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how expensive. Like UX designers, boy, they've got to show how they can map everything together and everything else. I've sat in one of those and thought, oh, wow, I would not do this. But, you know, some people are good at stuff. Like that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, what are you seeing with regard to um, some of the new technologies, uh, HTML5, CSS3, mobile app development? Are you seeing a lot of uh, movement in that part? Yeah. There's a lot of it going on out there right now. Um, when you say a lot of it's going on, a lot of companies are demanding that kind of skill set. Um, and, and it's becoming very, very competitive. There's not a whole lot of people that have that. Um, and so when you do find it, a lot of employers usually react to it extremely fast. Um, How would you list that on, like what kinds of words would you be using on a resume? Are you using UI designer, uh, UX designer, or front end developer, or, or really the technologies HTML5, CSS3, jQuery, those so, kinds of things? So you're talking about acronyms in comparison to that? Yeah, word. yeah. In a Boolean search, when I do it, I'll say, UX or you know user experience, you know, and so I'll have those in quotations just so that it gives me one or the other, and it will identify that you know in anybody's profile, like on LinkedIn, or anybody's resume that I'm looking at, or resumes that do come up. Um, some of my Boolean search trees are ridiculously long. I can't even tell you, but I mean that's why I save them is because it took so long to create something that actually works um, or pinpoint. As an example, if I have a, a job, uh, if I'm looking for a standard Java developer, depending on whatever the software stack is, will give me X amount of uh, Boolean search strings that I have saved. And in most cases, I also keep track of the number of candidates that I'm able to pull from that search string. So it kind of gives me, if I need to go for a big pool or a very small pool, then I can target that specific, specifically. Um, so you know, as far as a lot of those, anybody that's you know doing any recruiting are, are going to look for those things from a search string standpoint. I mean, we all start off with the Boolean search string says, okay, well we're looking for somebody that has everything. Well, we put all that stuff in there, yeah. and all of a sudden you come up with zero results. Okay, well you know what? I'm going to leave the HTML5, but I'm going to take out the CSS. See what that results. So, I mean, that's how it works on, on our end. Is that if we can't find somebody that has 100% of everything, then we start working our way back. So if you have, you know, one of the things that really worries me about individuals' resumes is that when I take a good look, yes, I'm looking for specific things and I'm looking for for a manager. However, the other thing is too is that I know for a fact that not everybody's resume is only one page or two pages. There's more experience to be explored. And you got to, That's why I say sometimes with a good recruiter, you've got to have them, or a good recruiter will take the time to get you on the phone and speak to you a little bit further. I don't care if it's for 10 or 15 minutes. If, if somebody's piqued my curiosity enough, I want to call and say, hey, I noticed that you have 
C, C++, do you have any exposure working with C Sharp? You know, or some people have just done, you know, development in C, C++, but if they've done stuff with Java, I mean, it could not, and it may not even be listed on, on the resume. So you've got to be able to have somebody that's going to go <coughs> and inquire and find out whether we have those. Um, most recruiters, like for me, I don't like posting positions out there. The reason is because I get a whole bunch of people applying, and you know, if I have to go through hundreds of people, it really takes a lot of my time to do that. So I traditionally like to go up and find In some cases, that's why we're keeping good recruiters good. You know, as an example, Bolt's tied into every single company in the Pacific Northwest, and they know everybody's software stack. They know what kind of people they're always looking for. So, is that about? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, First impressions are usually very important. First impression when you're trying to connect with an employer or recruiter is your resume. Any that's about ten percent of the battle. Yeah, just getting getting it seen, but also that that quick scan that you said, you know, less than a minute, it, it's gone if it doesn't catch you. Do you have a, uh, an idea of where we find really good examples of resumes that would be a, a format that would catch you if it, of course, was the right condition? You know, there's a lot of resume format programs out there. Yeah. Um, I traditionally say stay away from those. Uh, basically, what I, would, what I would suggest to anybody is that, you know, one, have an objective. You know, like, I have a basic summary and say, this is where I'm coming from, this is what I've done. It's all in a very short five line summary about who I am. <coughs> and then we start going into the specific skills um, as far as what, I, what I've done in the past. Um, I think that resumes that are done on the format where there seems like it'd be a big border on the left hand side and everything's pushed over to the right and listed that way, drives us crazy. Why? It just makes the resume that much longer. Um, you know, spending money to have somebody fix your resume, you know, it can be kind of costly and it's not always effective either. Um, I would say that probably take a look and have the general information, your summary, your practical skills and applications or anything that you've gone to school for all in the very beginning, and then step into your positions. Um, you know, or sometimes you may have an objective, like my objective is to get into software development and to do this. And, um, as long as you have a good idea of what direction you're going in, that can get bought off by anybody. If, you, if we see something that's just kind of more of a general statement, you know, uh, it kind of gives us that, you know, this person just wants to be employed. You know? So, you know, so it's, it's, it's always nice to make sure that within your resume that you're clearly stating what you've done or what you really want to do. So, can you talk a little bit about how you organize LinkedIn so it isn't chronological in experience? Because I found that when you put your job experience in there, they require you to put the dates that you put there. And when you do that, they list it right on the you know the first page, right. and that's not what I'm I'm looking for. Being able to put past experience up there first. Okay, so you're looking to put past experience up first in terms of the skills, the transferable skills. Yeah, that you my have last job I was it was as a research scientist. Okay, I got it because of my background in science, but that's not what I'm looking to do right now. Right. I'm do management of some kind, which I have done in prior jobs. My suggestion then on LinkedIn is not to specify all of the positions that you held. It's just build out your summary to okay. the capacity. With the dates. And exactly. Well, yeah, but not going back too far right. in regards to dates. But uh, there's a few people that I've seen that, that have done that, where, say for instance, what direction are you moving into? What's what? Are you looking to go into more management then? Product management, project management, kind of. Okay. How's your background with product management? Well, it, I come from a, a retail background. Okay. And so the transferring those skills into terminology that will translate into project management or products. That's what I'm struggling with. You did marketing? Mm -hmm. Brand management? Uh, yeah, basically. Kind yeah. Of what in marketing the marketing products that we sold, marketing the store. And how many years experience would you say that you have been doing that? A lot. A lot? More than seven or eight. Okay, then you should give me a <laughs> 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 
position. I know, I saw one of them already. The product managers right now. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because you can only get the job description. Here's the thing, you know, as an example, like this product manager job. Basically, what it is is that we have a new game, or anybody that's familiar with lineage. We have two games. Lineage. There's a product manager position that's actually kind of uh, uh, kind of taking the product and trying to do a little bit of branding and marketing to gain more visibility for it. The other product manager that I have, or product manager role that I have is specific to a game that's not yet released. It's not going to be released for another year to year and a half. So that person has really got their work cut out for them because they got to take it from pretty much inception to the Does that make sense? So I mean, if you, if, there's only a few qualifications I can think of off the top of my head. You have prior project management, account management, and you know branding, marketing. So if you have any of those things, in addition to if you're a responsible individual and you love playing video games, that's all the qualifications I need. I mean, funny enough, I mean, um, I'm actually dressed up. <laughs> <laughs> Usually I'm just, uh, you know, a t-shirt, jeans, you know, tennis shoes. I mean, in our, in our environment, it's, I remember going in for my interview and I was wearing khaki slacks, button down shirt and a tie. First thing my director looked at me and he said, you know, number one thing I gotta tell you, if I hire you, Never come in here dressed like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That interview lasted five minutes, and I realized I was, I was like, okay. You walked out the door, and we see you now I'll one. Uh, so, that, you know, it's, you know, to kind of go back, you know, in, in regards to, you know, what you're, what you're looking at, to speak to LinkedIn, you know, and everything else. By me asking you these questions, that's got my wheels turning. Okay, well, here's a potential person that, you know, could be a fit. For me, I would have to sit down and have a conversation. I don't, I don't do the traditional interview. And the reason is because I want to know everything that I can know about my candidates for any role, whether I'm referring them to somebody else, whether it's something that I have. I want to get to know who you are because I think that's the most important thing. So for me, if you want to get my number, I'll talk to you later. Take a look and see what your qualifications are, and see what we can do to see because then. That's when my mind starts to turn to think, okay, well, how can I present this individual for this role? And what's going to be the cap what's going to capture the manager's mind? What's going to make the most the sense? There's managers that I send somebody over and they don't even look at the resume. I'll just give them it. Because they know that they're not going to get anything that's not tangible or not viable for that sense of Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. Um <clears throat> as far as uh like demand for these frameworks. Uh, do you see much demand for these frameworks? Uh, Joomla, Drupal, or WordPress? For a person uh, who has a skill set to build a website using those frameworks. Drupal, we use that. Um, not so much of a WordPress. I don't see that too often out there. Um, Joomla is starting to get a little bit more popular. You know, um, I think it's just different with every organization. Even when I go work for somebody, First thing I ask is, what's your software stack? Like, what are you guys working with? Mm -hmm. There's stuff that managers give me that I haven't even heard of. In fact, by the time I do my Wikipedia and Google searches, I'm realizing, well, heck, this is all over Europe. It's not even here in the U.S. Um, there's a, there's a, I mean, there's two programs that come to mind. Um, one of them happens to be something called ClickView. ClickView. Uh, ClickView. That's Q L I K D I E W. Right. After doing the research, I'm there, NCSoft was asking me for that. I was like, oh, I've never heard of that. You know, start doing my research. Well, guess what? You find tons of people in Europe. You know, you try to find anybody that has an experience here in the U.S. The only people that's associated with that is going to be account managers. They're not report developers or anything else. You know, it hasn't really. It, so the company bought technology that's not readily abundant here in the U.S. So you got to kind of keep that in mind. So sometimes you got to take a look and see what Asia is doing, what Europe's doing, to kind of keep up with the pace. Yeah. So ClickView, what it does is it actually consolidates a big old reporting program. Uh, we use CodeNotes. Uh, it basically pulls all the data and just puts it up in a real fancy way at this point. Okay. That's what it is. Like an um, infographic kind of thing. Correct. So, but I mean, it was just odd. 
Would you recommend uh, affiliation or membership in any professional organizations such as AITP or things like that? Um, those are good. If you want to meet other counterparts that may be able to help you get visibility into the companies that they're at or whatever it may be, networking is a big, big key thing. Um, and that's exactly where the recruiting industry is going. It's full on networking. I'm always at the east side networking event. They hear that. Of Seattle Linked or something? LinkedIn it's Seattle? It's LinkedIn, but it's, it's called East Side Networking Event. And generally, there's like anywhere from three to 400 people there. Wow. It's usually at the Rock Bottom Brewery in Bellevue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, those places are great uh, simply because 
all of the major players in the area, managers, recruiters, HR managers, talent acquisition, they're all there. So it's an informal environment where you're sucking down a beer or whatever, talking yeah, to your buddy. You walk in, grab a beer, you basically walk around with a name tag and just go around and introduce yourself. Uh, I had two people that actually made a uh, transition. They were both in sales. They wanted to do, funny enough, something to do with recruiting. It was something of interest. I took them to a networking event. I would say that both of them were employed a week later. Wow. Because they ran into people there that were looking for you know, giving people an opportunity you know, to try something new, somebody that they could train, somebody that was tangible. You know, and I was there with them doing some introductions. Uh, but I would highly suggest going to, to those things because you'll meet people that you never, one, find on LinkedIn, two, you never would run into them. You'll meet a lot of important people, you know, from, I mean, there's a lot of directors, VPs, that are, you know, like Microsoft being the giant that it is, um, that will that certainly connect with you. So that that we're going to share that that event is that uh, does it have a LinkedIn group associated with it? It does. And okay. Just look up Eastside Networking Event. Okay. For for Bellevue, yeah. And uh, join in, and they send out those invites every single month. They have a Seattle Networking Event too. So there's a bunch of other smaller ones, but uh, Eastside works out with you. Okay. So we do have pizza here. Speaking of networking. Uh, this might be a good transition to our networking event uh, following the speaker series. You can uh, chat with Al, um, give him your resume, uh, or get him uh, get connected with him on LinkedIn. Um, we'll have pizza and soda out here in the, uh, just outside the, the door here. So please feel free to hang around. And, and, uh, I'll stick talk. around too if you have individual questions. I can help. When Gilgore is still coming out. <laughs> Ask him that offline, Alicia, and we'll start the piece here. Let's thank him. Soon. Yes, soon. <laughs> <laughs>